Krishna Karna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Koranke Radhe Vrindavanishwari Vrishapanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaye Vacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shunyavati Paschatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so we welcome everyone to this uh, ongoing presentation, Bhakti Shastri. We're into the 18th chapter now, and uh, we're we're looking. We heard how uh, Prabhupada explained this 18th chapter is like a summary of what's been taught in the Bhagavad Gita. He said, actually, Bhagavad Gita is already finished in 17 chapters. This 18th chapter is like the summary of everything taught. So we began in the last class, we heard about karma, karma sanyas and tiaga. Arjuna wanted to understand the difference between sanyas and karma. Maybe you remember how sannyas means giving up work, but not all kinds of work, but work which is directed towards fruit of aims. And tyaga is renouncing the desire to enjoy the fruit of work. So in tyaga, one still works, but he's not working to enjoy the fruit. So in that sense, then sannyas and tyaga are the same. So after explaining about karma and sannyas, but then Krishna went on to describe about jnana yoga. And he was describing the five factors which influence different activities. In every activity, that's a not, this is the knowledge of sankhya, right? We heard about the five factors. There's a, the place and the endeavor and the senses, and the super-soul, and the person. These five factors influence every action. So the most important was the super-soul. Super-soul overseeing everything, the presence of the super-soul. Let's, so I'll, I, before we actually begin, uh, I wanted to just show some things which we were discussing yesterday, in the last class. We were discussing uh, some points and I thought I should show you so, uh, some quotes here. I'll just put it onto uh, screen, share, screen sharing. Okay. So remember we were talking about Charity, mm, document, yeah, we were talking about charity, so here's a nice quote from the Srimad Bhagavatam, 
from the Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, second canto, third chapter, describing about how we have to be careful where we distribute our charity and depending on who we give it to, we get different results. So we like to get the maximum benefit from our charity. So it's described here. The, materi the materialistic way of pious activities like charity is recommended in the Smriti Shastras as quoted by Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Money given in charity to a suitable person is guaranteed bank balance in the next life. Such charity is recommended to be given to a brahmana. If the money is given to a non-brahmana without brahminical qualification, the money is returned in the next life in the same proportion. If it is given in charity to a half-educated brahmana, then the money is returned double. And if the money is given in charity to a learned and fully qualified brahmana, the money is returned a hundred and a thousand times. And if the money is given to a Veda paraga, one who has factually realized the path of the Vedas, it is returned... Uh, it is, it, it is returned by unlimited multiplication. The ultimate end of Vedic knowledge is realization of the personality of Godhead Lord Krishna, as stated in Bhagavad Gita. There is a guarantee of money being returned if given in charity, regardless of the proportion. Similarly, a moment passed in the association of a pure devotee by hearing and chanting the transcendental message of the Lord is a perfect guarantee for eternal life, returning back home, back to Godhead. Maddam gatva punarjanma navidyate. In other words, a devotee of the Lord is guaranteed eternal life. A devotee's old age or disease in the present life is but an impetus for such guaranteed eternal life. So my purpose in showing you this, I want, uh, because some people were trying difficulty to understand why giving in charity, you know, why we should be careful while we give it. So here's the example that when we, when we give it to the very qualified person, and you get much, much more benefit back, right? So that was one point which was there from the last class. There was one other point I wanted to show you. We were discussing about pavriti and nivriti, and I mentioned about the quotes. So I thought it would be helpful just to encourage you. You know, I think you all have these quotes, right? Is it right? Do you have the quotes? Yes, Maharaj, we have. Yes, yeah, so this one yes, quote, well, this one quote is here about pavriti nivriti. This is from chapter 16. Pavriti means the things we accept and nivriti is the things we don't accept, we give up. So Prabhupada writes here, Krishna consciousness movement is for this purpose, to change the pavriti and nivriti. Why person is not accepting tea or smoking or something else? And why other person is accepting the same thing? Amongst the animal also, you give something to animal, he will reject. And another thing, he will accept. These two things are, are there in every living being, accepting something, rejecting something. This is called pavriti and nivriti. So for the human form of life is so far the human form of life is concerned there must be some pavriti and nivriti. There is that inclination, pavriti and nivriti, but they should be synchronized, systematized, what things we should accept, what things we should reject. That we must learn. Therefore we have got so many books, literature, education what things we should accept and what things we should reject. 
Just like these European American boys, before coming to my shelter, they were doing everything. We prohibit illicit sex. We prohibit intoxication. We prohibit meat eating. We prohibit gambling. So these boys and girls were accustomed to all these habits, pavriti. But they have now changed their pavriti because they want to become sura, in other words, godly. They want to achieve the ultimate goal of life. One may or may not know what mode of life we should accept. One may not know what mode of life we should reject. But in the Shastra, in the teaching of great men, learned scholars, things are there. We have to accept. We may not know, but we should accept. The Krishna Consciousness Movement is for this purpose, to change the Pavriti Nivriti. This is from Prabhupada's lecture in Tokyo. You can see there in your quotes, it's a very nice quote. Okay, so, uh, we're, um, okay. So, I hope that's helpful to you. I certainly encourage you to make good use of the quotes when you come to write essays and you write up stuff. If you can use the quotes, it's very powerful, very helpful to give some real substance to your essay. Okay, so we'll go ahead now. Uh, we have our PowerPoint. Okay, so we're discussing action. Three factors that motivate action. Remember? Knowledge, the object of knowledge, and the knower. You know, you just have to learn these things. You just have to memorize these things. It's not so easy to us to understand, but we just simply have to accept that these are the three factors which motivate the action, and then the three constituents of action, the senses and mind, the, the work and the doer, meaning the body. So, after establishing this, Lord Krishna, oh, oh here's, a, here's a quiz, you may like to answer, what does Tyaga mean, do you remember? Someone like to reply? Renunciation. Tyaga means what? Tyaga means... Giving up the results of action. Right, giving up the results of action. Not just renunciation, but giving up the results of action, right. Means renouncing the, uh, the results of action. And what is sannyas? Sannyas means Maharaj, renunciation of the work which, which puts you in bonded labor. Right, giving up this work. Giving up bodily work. Okay, good. How are they the same? Well, it's the same, right? It just, it, it, it just is. It works out the same. One, the Chiaga is giving up, the, is not attached to the fruit of the work, and the sannyasi is giving up the work. So it comes to the same thing. Hmm? You're controlling your senses in both cases. They're controlling their senses in both cases, yes. True. They're detached, Krishna, right? Both, huh? both of them are for the pleasure of Krishna. Both of them are for pleasure of Krishna. Well, not necessarily, no, not necessarily in this case. We've not, they're not talking about Krishna Bhakti here. They're just talking, you know, Tyaga and Sanyas, this is not on the level of Bhakti yet. We're not okay. speaking about Krishna. Okay. But they're both detached from the result. 
Why is material life compared to a rose? Anyone remember? Because Maharaj, it gives, uh, it is pleasurable, uh, pleasurable uh, uh, things as well as painful things. So it's not that you just get pleasure or you just get happiness. You also get misery or suffering. Yeah, where's the misery and suffering in the rose? Right, yeah, the thorns are the misery of the, yeah, the, the rose, the fragrance of the flowers, very nice, the petals are very soft, but there are thorns there. <laughs> and they bring, they give the pain, right, okay. Uh, oh, the three constituents of action, do you remember? We just read them. There was knowledge. Huh? Knowledge, object of knowledge, and uh, knowledge, object of knowledge, and one more thing. Knower, knower. The knower. Okay, good. Yeah. And the five causes of action. Place, doer, efforts, and uh, senses, and uh, the sanction of the supreme Lord Maharaj. Yeah, the super soul. Let's hear them again. Five the place or the body? The body, yeah, the place or the body. And the doer, that is the asthma. Okay. And the senses of the, the, the senses. Yes, the senses. And uh, the efforts or the ability. The endeavor. Endeavor, yes. And the sanction of the supreme word. And the super soul, right. Okay. Yeah. Which cause of action is essential? Why? Sanction of the super soul? Yes. He's the overseer and permitter, right? If I'm not doing anything, Krishna is not responsible for anything, then who is doing everything? Anyone like to answer? Oh, modes of nature is responsible? I'm guessing on that. Hmm? The various senses. We're not doing anything, but we're still responsible because everything is taking place according to our initial desire. It's our own desire which initiates everything. Krishna is just facilitating our desires. It's like that. We're responsible. Okay, we're going on to the next section. Entanglement of the three modes of material nature. Maharaj, yes? Can I ask a small question? Okay. Uh, this is just some clarification in my mind. To you, maybe it will clarify. We just now discussed uh, that uh, tyaga and sanyas, they are same in terms of that there is detachment from the result. Okay. If we say are they different? What? The question is, are they different? If the question is, are uh, is sanyas and tyaga different? So, what would be the answer? No, they're not different. They're the same. They are same. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, so looking at the three modes of nature, three modes of nature in these six different items will be discussed. Remember the, the, the factors, motivating action, the constituents of action, knowledge, action, the worker, understanding, determination, happiness. These things are all going to be described in the three different modes. First of all, knowledge. Knowledge in the mode of goodness means seeing one undivided, 
spiritual nature in all living entities. Seeing the jiva soul in every body is in the mode of goodness. Right? This is seeing with the eye of knowledge. You see everyone equally. See the soul in every living entity. That's the mode of goodness. What about knowledge in the mode of passion? Seeing a different type of living entity determined by every different body, no individual soul, sometimes one soul beyond the body. So seeing different, make a distinction based on the body. That's knowledge and passion. Knowledge and passion leads to different theories of equality based on mundane logic regard to different groups of people. For example, dogs are friends, cows are food. <laughs> All right? People have pet dogs and they eat the cows. This is the Kali Yuga, unfortunately. So this is the, the passionate mo mode, distinguishing on the basis of the body. People say, I like animals, and they eat cows. Now, knowledge and ignorance. Knowledge by which one is attached to one kind of work, without knowledge or without knowledge of the truth, and which is meager is in the mode of ignorance. Knowledge concerned with keeping my body comfortable. God is money. Knowledge means satisfying the body's demands. This is, this is ignorance. So you can see different levels of knowledge there described in the modes. Going on, action, in goodness, done according to prescribed duties, regulated and without attachment, hate and love, and without desire for fruit of results. That is action in the mode of goodness, Prescribes, prescribed duty, regulated without attachment, without desire to enjoy the results. In passion, performed with great effort, seeking to gratify desires enacted from a sense of false ego. Great endeavor, the mode of passion, you can see this coming out every time, the mode of passion. Great endeavors, working so hard and for your own sense gratification. An action in the mode of ignorance, performed in illusion, disregard scriptures, not thinking of future reactions or pain caused to others, and done to escape, to escape from responsibility, to escape from proper life. So different levels of action in the modes. The worker, this is a nice picture here. You can see the nice worker lady cleaning the big temple room. Does duty without attachment, not involved with the three modes, without wavering in success or failure, with determination and enthusiasm. Ah, so this is uh, cleaning our Mayapur temple here. <laughs> I've, I've not seen that lady clean the temple. Usually it's the brahmacharis who clean it. But anyway, sometimes she may have got to help. So this is worker in the mode of goodness. You do the duty without attachment.
Now the worker in passion greedy for the fruits of his work, always envious, moved by joy and sorrow and motivated by personal desire. You can see the different natures exhibited. And then the worker in the mode of ignorance, against the scripture, obstinate, cheating, insulting, lazy, procrastinating, doesn't consider the consequences. That, I'm just giving you the main points of each of these different cases, okay? Worker in ignorance is like that. Understanding. Very important to have understanding, proper understanding in goodness, knows what is to be done and what is not to be done. All right. We were just reading. Pavritim cha, nevritim cha. Something is pavriti and something is nevriti. We have to know what to do and what not to do, what things to be given up and what things to be accepted. So this is understanding in goodness. What is to be feared and what is not to be feared? What is binding and what is liberating? In passion, cannot distinguish between religion and irreligion, between what should be done and what should not be done. In the mode of passion and then in the mode of ignorance, considers irreligion to be religion and under the spell of irreligion and illusion strives in the wrong direction. So this is all very logical. Krishna is presenting it for us. Just to summarize, this understanding and the modes. In passion, cannot distinguish, not sure what's religion. But in irreligion, he's got it totally wrong, convinced irreligion is right and religion is wrong. <laughs> Determination. We can see nice pictures here. Haridas Thakur chanting the holy name and Hanuman coming with the Ganga mud in the mountain to give the herbs to revive Lakshman. So that kind of determination unbreakable, sustained by yoga practice, controlling the mind and senses. This kind of determination we need, right? This is very powerful, strong determination. But in the mode of passion, we may have determination, but why? For fruit of results in religion, economic development and sense gratification. I have we're determined. Great de demons are also very determined. They want these things. They want to enjoy sense gratification. And in ignorance, determination is stuck in dreaming, fearfulness, lamentation and moroseness. They don't achieve anything. So no, no real determination. Happiness, very interesting one. Happiness in the mode of goodness. In the beginning like poison, but ends like nectar and awakens one to self-realization. Mm. You can see the yogis tolerating to get the highest taste. In the mode of passion, happiness is there from the senses, come in contact with the sense objects and it is described like nectar in the beginning and poison at the end. And then in the mode of ignorance, blind to self-realization, delusion from beginning to end and comes from sleep and laziness. Yeah, the happiness in the mode of ignorance, sleep, 
and laziness. Don't do anything. That's their ha the happiness in the mode of ignorance. So it's pointed out to us, there's no being existing who is freed from the three modes. So how conscious we have to be of these modes of nature. Okay, quick quiz, just to revise everything. One vision, when one's vision is filtered through knowledge, tinted by each of the three modes, what does he see? Who would like to describe knowledge in the mode of goodness? We want everyone take a turn. Try to answer one. Knowledge in the mode of goodness means what? One, per, one person? Yes, Maharajji. Seeing as Jeevas soul equally in everybody. Okay, seeing. See the jiva so equal in everyone. Okay, someone else can tell me knowledge in the mode of passion. And what about the mode of ignorance? Knowledge in the mode of ignorance? Okay. Anybody else like to add anything? The knowledge in the mode of ignorance? It means one is just busy in satisfying one's mind body's demands. Oh. Okay. Let's go on. What is the motivation for action in each of the modes? What about the motivation for action in goodness? Yes? What? The action which is regulated and uh, which is performed basically with our attachment or love or hatred and no desire. Okay. Yes, good. What about action in the mode of passion? Very intense endeavors, right? Great efforts to satisfy, and, and the demands are very great. Okay, what about action in the, in the mode of ignorance? Motivation for action in ignorance? Right, yeah. Yeah, they don't continue, continue. In the mode of goodness, we follow the Shastra. In the mode of ignorance, they don't have, they disregard, they go against the Shastra. Good. Yeah, they also, they also don't think about the results or that's going to be painful or what the reactions are going to be. They just do. Okay, very good, yes. Going ahead. Qualities of the worker in each of the three modes. The worker in goodness. Yes, he, he's very dutiful, okay, and anything else? With great, with great determination and enthusiasm. Okay, yeah. And he is not affected by failure or success. Oh, okay, so he detached from the result, right, yeah. Okay, what about the worker in passion? Greedy to enjoy the. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
progress, you know, uh, anchoring for more and more, you know, his result and uh, looking for the uh, end result only, not on the work. All right. And the worker in ignorance? Okay, very good, yeah. And then a person in the mode of ignorance, how does a person in the mode of ignorance think things should be done? Person in the mode of ignorance thinks should be, things should be done what? How? Against the scriptures? Yeah, yeah, they, they don't care for the scriptures. They're, they want to do everything in... Against the scriptures, right? They don't accept scriptures. Also, Maharaj, they're always like when they do their um, things, they're basically cheating others and insulting others. They're lazy and they don't consider consequences here also. Right. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead. Determination and the mode of passion. Determination. Uh huh. Right. They're not able to distinguish. You're right. That is between action that should be done and action that should not be done. All right. Good. Happiness and goodness is in the beginning. How is it? Happiness. Poison. Like poison. Huh? And then, and then at the end, nectar. like nectar. And happiness and passion is? First it is nectar and then it is poison. Poison at the end, okay. And happiness and ignorance is in the beginning? Poison in the beginning and poison at the end. Yes, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. So going ahead, talking about worshipping the Lord through one's work. is true renunciation brings freedom from reaction. Right? How would we call this? Worshipping the Lord through one's work? This will be like karma yoga, right? It's going to be like karma yoga. Niskam karma, huh? Renunciation of the fruit. Yeah, renunciation. By renunciation and freedom from reaction. So from text 41 to 48, we can see, let's see where we are in the book. I have to look, my bag would be now. So we spoke about understanding and determination and the worker, uh, determination, happiness in the modes, then going ahead text 41, oh. Oh, text 40 describes there's no being existing either here or among the demigods who is freed from these three modes of nature. So even in the higher planets, the modes of nature are there. Text 41 describes the four varnas are distinguished by their qualities born of their own natures in association with material modes. All right, so the four modes of nature, and Lord Krishna is going to describe, first of all, the brahmana, qualities of a brahmana. And you can see four, uh, the four varnas, the brahmana has the most qualities. How many qualities? How many qualities does the brahmana supposed to have here in Bhagavad Gita? Nine. Nine, yes. Okay. Uh, some other shastra, they describe twelve qualities. 
in the social body. The different varnas are compared to parts of the social body. So the brahmana is which part of the body? The head, right. And the kshatriya is? The arms. The Vaishya is? The abdomen, the, the belly. The belly. And the Sudra? The legs. Okay. So the Brahman, the head is very important. If there's no head, then the body is useless. Right? In France, in France, even today, they have the guillotine. They cut off the head. Then the body is useless. No, can't do. You can manage without the, without the legs, you can manage without the arms, without the belly, but you need the head. So the brahmana is a very important part of the social body. So nine qualities are there. Earlier, which chapter did Lord Krishna describe Varnashram? Do you remember? Fourth chapter. Huh? Fourth chapter. Fourth chapter. You know the verse? Right. Guna and karma, right? So these different varnas should be understood according to guna and karma, not janma. Birth is not the important thing. It's guna and karma. Now you may be born in the brahmana family. That's an advantage, but it's not enough. Just like your father may be doctor, you still have to study. Then you can become doctor. Or your father may be high court judge. You still have to study. Then you can become high court judge. So Bra Brahmana also is not simply by birth. You have to be trained. You have to cultivate the qualities. The Brahmana also has to be initiated. So these things are required. Sanatana Goswami, he quotes the Shastra. He said, anyone can become a Brahmana. Anyone. He said, and he gives an example, he said, just like a gold can be made by the alchemical process, bell metal, bell metal can be transformed into gold by the alchemical process. Does everyone want to become a brahmana? No. Not everybody wants to become a brahmana. Because brahmanas are not rich. Generally, brahmanas are poor. Right? Brahmanas are cursed by Lakshmi, not to have wealth. So take up the Brahmana profession means you, you're not going to be very rich. But we shouldn't worry about wealth, we should worry about character. The Brahmana will have a good character, very noble character, good character. That's more important than material wealth. So these nine qualities are given for the Brahmana. Samodamasta pasocham shantir arjavam evacha jnana vigyana mastikyam brahma karma swabhavajam. Brahmana has to work with these qualities. Right? Truthfulness, very important. Samodamasta pasocham shantir arjavam evacha. Arjavam, truthfulness, is it? We're going to right? Arjavam, honesty, right? Arjavam, honesty. So, Arjavam, truthfulness. Prabhupada gave the example, told the story about the young boy. Uh, young boy wants to go into the Guruku. So, he, the teacher asked the young boy, who's your father? So, the boy said, I, I'll have to go and ask my mother. So, he went home, asked his mother, who is father? Mother told the boy, I don't know who is your father. So the boy came back and he told the teacher, my mother doesn't know who is my father. So when the teacher heard this, he said, all right, you can come, you can be a student in our school. Why? Because he saw this boy is very truthful. He doesn't hide anything. So he gave him the chance to become a student. So Brahmana means like that, very straightforward. He won't hide the facts. He's truthful and he's very uh, pure or, you know, socham, samodhamastapa socham, socham, that means cleanliness, 
purity. So Brahmana has to also do that like that. Uh, Prabhupada gave a very interesting e example about that because Prabhupada had studied chemistry as a young man and he remembered the chemical equation. Chemical equation, base plus acid will give salt plus water. So he said the same way, a brahmana in contact with a dirty place, he must clean it. If the brahmana contacts a dirty place and doesn't clean it, he loses his brahminical qualities. So this is the meaning to brahmana. There are different kinds of brahmanas. Not all brahmanas are devotees. There's brahmana, uh, there's brahmana pandits and there's brahmana vaishnava. There's a di different kinds of brahmanas. Some brahmanas are karmakandi brahmanas. They're just doing the ritual, rituals. But the, the vaishnava brahmanas are more important. So these qualities are there for the brahmana. We have to cultivate these qualities. A devotee is a vaishnava, means more than a brahmana. So he's expected to have these qualities. To, we should cultivate these nine qualities. That's why uh, we give the second initiation, we give the Gayatri mantra, we wear the brahman thread. With the, that, says, this, that is called diksha, the actual initiation when you are given the mantra. Okay, so that's a brahmana. Then the qualities of a kshatriya. Heroism, power, determination, how many qualities? Seven qualities. Okay, and you can see some of these qualities, you know, very special. Uh, generosity. The Brahmanas, they, they don't have much wealth, but the Kshatriya, they're, you know, powerful people and they're expected to have wealth and they're expected to distribute that wealth, to be generous in giving charity. Just like Janaka, Maharaj Janaka, he was very charitable. And he gave charity in, in, in abundance, he, profuse charity, he gave it to everyone. And, and uh, similarly also Karn, when Maharaj Yudhisthira did sacrifice, Karn was given the job to distribute charity. His name was Datta Karn because he liked to give charity, he enjoyed giving charity to people. And then also uh, Leadership, they have that Ishwara Bhav, right? They have that ability to control. It said like Arjuna, uh, Bhima, these people, you know, their voices were like thunder. When, th when they speak, you know, they have so much power of authority behind their voice. So natural, they had that natural leadership character because they were born in royal families, so they naturally had that Ishwara Bhav. And they're very, they're, they're, they're also not cowardly, they're heroes. They lead, they go into battle in front. They don't stay behind and send the others to fight. They go out there in front to fight. So this, some qualities, yes? They have to be qualified after birth. The birth, uh, birth is the advantage, but still they have to prove their qualification. Just like the example is given, Prabhupada gives the example about the, the young princes in Jaipur. You know, before they used to have the king and queens there in Jaipur, the king of Jaipur. And so the, the, before the prince would become the king, he would have to go into the forest and he would have to kill the tiger. He had to show his courage. He had to go there with a sword and he had to kill the tiger. No gun. No going with guns. He had to take a sword and go there and kill the tiger. And they'll bring back the head of the tiger, they'll put it in the palace. You can see of tigers there in the palace. If you go to the, the mahal there in uh, Jaipur, Raj Mahal, you can see inside the palace they've got many heads of tigers which were taken by these kings before they 
became the king, before they became the real Kshatriya, they had to prove their courage, like that. So birth is an advantage, but still they have to show, they have to prove their, qu their quality, prove their position. So it's not just simply by birth, no. But birth is advantage, certainly advantage is there. Somebody born in that family, it's going to be easier for them to cultivate that, to have that nature. But not always. And we see sometimes people born, born in a Brahmana family and they become very addicted to sinful habits and they have no interest in spiritual culture. So Kshatriya, Vaishya. Uh, the Vaishya is described in Bhagavad Gita. Krishi go raksha vaninam Vaishya karma svabhavajam. So Krishi go raksha vaninam. Krishi, farming. Lord Balaram is worshipped with the plough. We see Lord Balaram, one of his weapons is the plough and the other is the club. So Lord Balaram is carrying the plough and Lord Krishna is playing the flute because Lord Krishna is taking care of the cows, Goraksha. And Balaram's Krishi, he's doing the far he's overseeing the farming and taking part in the ploughing. So this is Krishna and Balaram, they're showing the beauty of the farming and the importance of the Vaishya. And so the business of the Vaishya is farming and cow protection, very important to take cows, to protect them. And the bulls, you can see in the picture, we use the bulls also, plowing the fields and pulling the cars like that. So everyone should be engaged, very important, keep everyone engaged, have some work to do. Not that, well, everybody go to factory, now look at the situation. If everybody was in, in the countryside, there would be no problem. So farming, cow protection and business, of course, the Vaishya also do trading. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Sudra. The Sudra's duty is to serve others. You can see in the illustration, different activities all going on. So, Prabhupada describes in the Vedic culture, the Sudra people were not given wealth. They would be given food, they would be given clothing, and they would be given homes, a place to stay. They were not given wealth because they didn't really know how to use wealth. And we see that if you give money to the wrong people, they'll use it for drugs, they'll use it for alcohol, they'll use it for gambling, they'll use it for all their sinful activities. So they, they should be taken care of. Just like Mahatma Gandhi, he had the program Roti Kapre Makan, right? Roti Kapre Makan, you get your chapati, you get your cloth, and you get a place to stay. If you have that, you're, you're, you're taken care of, you have no problem. So these four different varnas are there and they're all meant to work for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. There's meant to be cooperation between the four varnas. Not that one varna is better than another. They're all serving the Supreme Lord. So there has to be that spiritual vision to see everyone equally, not to discriminate, oh I am high class, this is Brahmana, this is Sudra, Sudra is low class. No, everyone is a servant, everyone is serving the Supreme Lord and working for the pleasure of the Lord. Here you can see in this picture, by worship of the Lord, who is the source of all beings and who is all-pervading, a man can attain perfection 
through performing his own work. Text number 46. We see the different nice illustrations here. Offering fruits to Krishna, offering flower garlands to Krishna, offering a lamp to Krishna. Okay. Any questions so far? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, Maharaj, uh, you mentioned uh, in, the, in the verse 40, it's mentioned that even the Devatas um, uh, have the three modes. But do the Devatas have all the three modes? Uh, oh. Even passion and ignorance? Oh, yes. You know, sometimes Indra does things, you know, you know, you must know about Indra, how sometimes he will, you know, he'll become attracted to some other man's wife or something, and he'll do yes, some. Mother. So these kind of things go on even in the higher planets. And ignorance as well? Yeah, well, that's ignorance, isn't it? Not just passionate. Varnas Maharaj, is that also there in the upper planetary systems? In the higher planets, well, certainly there are there are great sages. Uh, generally, they're all they're all demigods there, the demigods or devas, you know. So certainly they, they don't have uh, to they don't have the kind of nature of life like we have, where we have uh, we have to worry about death and disease, the higher planets is none of that. They, they don't suffer aging and they don't suffer the disease. These kind of things are not there in the heavenly planets. Okay. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, uh, the knowledge in uh, goodness, uh, we see every soul equally. So what is that? Every soul, we, we will not recognize this is a Brahmana or this is a doctor or this is a uh, elephant. We will not recognize anything like that? Well, of course, we will see the different bodies, but we see also that we, we will understand with the eye of knowledge, the eye of knowledge trains us to understand that there's a spirit soul within each body. The Brahmana, by his good karma, somehow he's got the body of the Brahmana. And, and the soul in the elephant, somehow, by his karma, he's placed into that body of the dumb elephant. So we just understand that different souls have made proper use or misuse of their free will. The soul which is in the body of an elephant has misused his free will and he's put, been put into the body of the elephant. But the, the soul in the body of the Brahmana, they've made proper use of their free will and been given the body of the Brahmana. So we, we have to see things like that, in that way. Yes? <laughs> well, they're describing the activities, the, the activities, because they, they do that work. So, uh, the Vaishya, it, it's not that he has to have certain qualities to be a Vaishya, it's just the Vaishya is known by how he works. 
You see, it's different. Uh, uh, the Brahmana is known by his qualities, not so much work, but, but the, the Vaishya, his, he, he's recognized simply by his activities. Now somebody may be a good Vaishya and somebody may not be a good Vaishya. Some, but they do the work, they do the farming, they take care of the cows, they do some business. Now if you have to put the qualities of the Vaishya, what should we say? They have to be, what, should, what, should, what do they have to do? They have to be hard working. Or they have to be on. Will they be on? They, they won't be honest because the Vaishyas, generally Vaishyas are not honest people. <laughs> they will often cheat and <laughs> say, Oh, for you, no profit. For you, I'm not making any profit. A little difficult to describe what should be the qualities of a Vaishya. No, Krishna is just describing what work they will do. But for the Brahmana, it, the, it, Certainly there are certain duties for the brahmana, but the quality, the character is most important. And similarly for the kshatriya, his cat, that they must have that character in order to take that role. Thank you, Maharaj. It's like, that's a, a very good point you made, Maharaj. I, I never thought of that before, actually, that you bring out this point that it's, it's certainly true that the Brahmana and Kshatriya, we, Krishna gives us the qualities, but when he talks about the Vaishya, and he just says what work they do. That's, that's the difference that the Vaishya, he, you know, he's a worker, he's doing this, you know. So what kind of business will he do? So Krishna discusses what kind of business they should be doing protecting the cows, it indicates something. And farming, it, we, sometimes we say it's the most pious profession. And so they, ha they have to be of a particular nature to do this kind of work as a Vaishya. Taking care of cows, people who take care of cows definitely will have a very pious nature. When, when uh, anybody who comes and a cow. If you want to get rid of your passion, get rid of your anger and so on, it's a very good activity. Go and take care of the cows, serve the cows. So protecting the cows, giving protection to the cows, certainly, you know, that you can be sure that these people will, must have very good qualities. And to be farming, to go in the fields every day and farm, they have to be you know, humble, they have to be hard-working. Certain qualities are required to do that kind of work. But everyone is sudra. They have to be reformed by the second birth. Oh. Hare Krishna.
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, we lost, uh, lost two, I think. Yeah, we had a power cut. Okay. I just got back, sorry. You know, this time of the year, this is a rainy season storm. We just had a big storm tonight. So the power's on and off. All right, so we'll, we'll go ahead. Let's see. Okay, so we're he, we're, we read the, the different varnas. Then takes 40, 48, oh, oh, 47 talks about doing your own duty. Don't try to do another's duty. Duties per prescribed according to one's nature are never affected by sinful reactions. So try to do another's duty. Even though you may think you can do it better, it's not very good. Better to just do one's own duty. Prabhupada explains in the purport, one should act to satisfy the Supreme Lord. This is the second paragraph of the purport. He was a Kshatriya. He was hesitating to fight the other party. But if such fighting is performed for the sake of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, there need, need be no fear of degradation. In the business field also, sometimes a merchant has to tell so many lies to make a profit. If he does not do so, there can be no profit. Sometimes a merchant says, Oh, my dear customer, for you I am making no profit. But one should know that without profit the merchant cannot, cannot exist. Therefore, it should be taken as a simple lie. If a merchant says that he is not making a profit, but the merchant should not think that because he is engaged in an occupation in which the telling of lies is compulsory, he should give up his profession and pursue the profession of a brahmana. That is not recommended. Whether one is a Kshatri, Vaishya, a Sudra doesn't matter. If he serves by his work the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even Brahmanas who perform different types of sacrifice sometimes must kill animals because sometimes animals are sacrificed in such ceremonies. Similarly, if a Kshatriya engages in his own occupation kills an enemy, there is no sin incurred. In the third chapter, these matters have been clearly and elaborately explained. Every man should work for the purpose of Yajna or for Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Anything done for personal sense gratification is a cause of bondage. The conclusion is that everyone should be engaged according to the particular mode of nature required, and he should decide to work only to serve the Supreme Lord, the Supreme Cause of the Supreme Lord. Okay, so Prabhupada describes clearly, elaborate how, do our duty, don't try to do other person's work. If you're a Vaishya, don't try to be the Brahmana. And, okay, next verse, text 48, Krishna is describing, Every endeavour covered by some fault, just as fire is covered by smoke. Therefore one should not give up work born of its nature. O son of Kunti, even if such work is full of fault, how do you like these illustrations? 
you can see that the the lady cooking, you know, maybe it's that the chat the pot went on fire, she burned everything. And then over here, ironing the cloth, <laughs> you know. He's doing doing his ironing, but he burned the cloth. Okay, so you do things wrong, but you know, don't get discouraged. Sometimes things will go wrong. You have to keep working. So Prabhupada writes in the purport there again, second paragraph. A very nice example is given here. Although fire is pure, still there is smoke. Yet smoke does not make the fire impure. Even though there is smoke in the fire, fire is still considered to be the purest of all elements. If one prefers to give up the work of a Kshatriya and take up the occupation of a Brahmana, he is not assured that in the occupation of a Brahmana there are no unpleasant duties. One may then conclude that in the material world no one can be completely free from the contamination of material nature. This example of fire and smoke is very appropriate in this con connection. When in winter time one takes a, a, a stone from the fire, sometimes smoke disturbs the eyes and other parts, but, but still one makes use of the fire despite disturbing conditions. Similarly, give up his, na his natural occupation because there are some disturbing elements. Rather, one should be determined to serve the Supreme Lord by his occupational duty in Krishna consciousness. Okay, so Krishna is describing here the importance, how we should work, what should be our attitude. Don't try to do another's work. Even something's difficult, goes wrong. Don't de don't discourage. There's everything. Everything uh, has its problems. A quiz. How can a worker in any of the varnas attain perfection? Who can answer? That's not perfection. That's not perfection. Right, you have to do it for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. Right. Next one. Name three of the Brahminical qualities. Let's have three people each give three qualities. Honesty. Yes. Yeah, socha means what? Cleanliness. Clean, cleanliness, right. True. We had honesty and cleanliness, and then. Religiousness. Religiousness. Tolerance. Tolerance. Yes, tolerance. Knowledge. Knowledge. Huh? Nobody's memorized this yet, huh? Peacefulness, self-control, and austerity. knowledge and vigyanam, realization, right? So Bra Brahmana should, no, Brahmana should have both qualities, knowledge and vigyan, vigyan and vigyan, the knowledge and the realization, how to apply it. So we should know the Brahminical qualities, nine qualities, important. Three of the Kshatriya qualities, there were seven. What? Valor. 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 Leadership. 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 
generosity, fearlessness, heroism, he's a hero, right? He's hero, yes, okay. And then, oh. Resourcefulness in battle. Very good, yes. Generosity, Maharaj. Yes, we had that. Yeah, we had that. Generous. Generosity. Gives charity. Okay. Going ahead. Okay, next section. 49 to 53. Maharaj. Yes? Can I please ask? I have a little doubt here. Okay. Towards the end, the last two, three lines, they say that the conclusion is that everyone should be engaged according to the particular mode of nature he has acquired. Yes. So, if suppose I take myself. So, what? For me, if I take myself, so how do I understand it that I have to be engaged according to the particular mode of nature I have acquired? So, so what's the answer? <laughs> How do we understand that? Yes, well, means that we're, if we're in the, in, it, rather it's our nature to work according to the modes of nature which we're in. Now somebody may be in the goodness, you may be in the mode of goodness and you try to go to work. In, and you work in an atmosphere which is full of the mode of ignorance, then you're not going to feel very comfortable there. You won't feel happy. You're, you're not going to find your, feel satisfied in that situation. Because by nature, you're in the mode of goodness. You want to be in a, a mode of goodness environment. And if you try to put yourself into, the mode of, into a mode of passion or ignorance, then you won't enjoy it, you won't feel satisfied, you won't feel comfortable with it. So, so how, do we, how do we understand uh, that, or how do we decide which mode I'm in? Well, you, by tr one way you can know is by your own experience, how you react in the different situations. You, in one situation, w when you put yourself into that situation, you will immediately know. Are you liking it? Are you comfortable there? Are you finding it all right? So by your own experience you can tell. But you can also be guided by your spiritual teacher. The spiritual teacher will know more about you and he can direct you to your nature. Thank you. Thank you very much. Somebody, somebody, other people, you know, they have to find it out for themselves. They, they put themselves into that situation and try it and by their own, wit, own experience, you know, are they happy? Are they feel satisfied? Are they comfortable in that situation? They're not. They know it's not their nature. They want to be in some other kind of situation. Because it's just not their nature to be there. So you want, we want to work into, in that kind of environment which is conducive for our own na nature, our guna, our modes of nature. Guna and karma also. You know, somebody is, has a very high intelligence rate and very intellectually inclined. So if you put them to do physical work, you know, or very but monotonous work in the factory, you know, they can't do it. They can't do it for long because it's not their nature, totally against their nature. But other people, you know, very simple people, they, you put them in there and they're very happy, they just stand there all day, they talk to their friends, they talk to the other people, they just stand and talk all day and they feel very happy, no problem, very satisfied because they're on a very different level, different level of thinking, different consciousness. So according to our nature, we have to find that situation. 
Okay, going ahead. The next, the next section. Oh, what happened? Let's see. Okay, so next section from 49 to 55 describing about how Jnana Yoga can lead to pure devotional service. All right, here's our Jnana Yogi meditating and here's the pure devotee, Haridas, the Tosi. Okay, so text 49. One who is self-controlled and unattached and who disregards all material enjoyment can obtain by practice of renunciation the highest stage, the highest perfect stage of freedom from reaction. So Krishna is describing how we can get to this highest stage by practice of renunciation. Renunciation means jnana yoga self-controlled, unattached, you can see there's no Krishna consciousness. So jnana yoga, right? and higher level, 50 goes on, O son of Kunti, learn from me how one who has achieved this perfection can attain to the supreme perfectional stage Brahman, the stage of highest knowledge, by acting in the way I shall now summarize. Okay? So, Lord is going to describe how we can come to this platform of Brahman from practice of Jnana Yoga, meditation. Prabhupada writes in the purport, one attains the supreme stage of Brahman simply by renouncing the results of his for the satisfaction of the Lord. That is the process of self-realization. The actual perfection of knowledge is in attaining pure Krishna consciousness. That is described in the following verses. So then text 51 to 53 describe different qualities by which one can come to this platform of Brahman. Being purified by his intelligence, controlling the mind with determination, giving up the objects of sense gratification, being free from attachment and hatred, one who lives in a secluded place, who eats little, who controls his body, mind and power of speech, who is always in trance and who is detached free from false ego, false strength, false pride, lust, anger, acceptance of material things, free from false proprietorship, peaceful. such a person is certainly elevated to the position of self-realization. Okay, so all of these different qualities describe the Jnana Yoga, how one cultivates all of this detachment, from the material and controlling the mind and free from all material qualities. Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport, he has no false ego because he does not accept the body as himself, nor has he a desire to make the body fat and strong by accepting so many material things. Because he has no bodily concept of life, he is not falsely proud. He is satisfied with everything that is offered to him by the grace of the Lord, and he is never angry in the absence of sense gratification. Nor does he endeavour to acquire sense objects. Thus, when he is completely free from false ego, he becomes 
non-attached to all material things. And that is the stage of self-realization of Brahman. That stage is called the Brahma Bhuta stage. When one is free from the material conception of life, he becomes peaceful and cannot be agitated. And then Prabhupada quotes a verse from the second chapter. Okay. Just a minute. No. So the, this is describing how the Jnana Yogi comes to the stage of Brahman, right? The stage of Brahman, simply knowing I'm not the body. But this is not, of course, what devotee worries about. We, in devotional service, we immediately come to the level of Brahman, simply by doing devotional service. But you can see for the Jnana Yogi, it's a long, difficult path. So many things to be done, so many qualities to be acquired, to come up to the level of Brahman. And that Brahman itself is still not perfection. Because they come to the level of Brahman and they simply understand, Aham Brahmasmi, I am not the body, I am Brahman. But what, can you, what do they do? They don't know what are spiritual activities. In a minute, we'll, we'll, let's see, where's the... Oh, here. You can see this picture here. Everyone can see this diagram? Yes, Maharaj. Are you seeing there? So, in the center of the picture, Niskama, Niskama Karma Yoga. You see on the bottom here, the yoga ladder, the bottom, Vikarma. Vikarma means actions against the scriptures. And then above Vikarma, Karma Kanda. Karma Kanda is also materialistic activity, fruit of activity. Karma Kanda is not really on the yoga ladder, it's on the bottom. So then, Sakama, Sakama Karma Yoga. That means you, you're doing Karma Yoga, but with some attachment to the results still. But Niskam Karma Yoga, you're detached from the result. So this is the yoga ladder coming up here. Astanga Yoga, Jnana and Sankhya Yoga, different ways by which we can come up to these different levels. Right? So you come to the level of Niskam Karma Yoga, you're detached from the work, then there's different ways you can go because one may not be a devotee. Not every Karma Yogi is a devotee. Mayavadis are also doing Karma Yoga. So they may merge. You can see on the, on the left of the picture, merge. So the, the, the Yogis, they can merge into that Brahma Jyoti. And some others, they want mystic cities. They, they come to Niskam Karma Yoga, they want mystic powers. Some of them even want to become God. They're thinking like that, I am God. Some want to realize the Paramatma, but some other Karma Yogi, they go on to realize Prema Bhakti, to realize devotional service. So, Krishna and at this stage, he's describing the yoga ladder here, coming up to the Brahma Bhuta platform. Brahma Bhuta platform simply means knowing I'm not the body, I am a soul. But you have to go on from there. We have to understand the soul, the business of the soul, and the soul's relationship with the Supreme Soul. So this is important to understand. For the impersonalist, they're, go, they're thinking, come to Brahman is perfection. They're thinking that's the end, that's the goal, that's their goal, just to merge, to come to the Brahman. And they're thinking that's perfection. They think there's nothing beyond that. But for a devotee coming to the Brahman, that's just the beginning. Devotional service begins on the platform of Brahman. We have to go on from there. So this is all very, very important to be understood. Uh, so the, the, the key verse, uh, 
if we go back, here's the, the key verse in this section, the verse which is really, really important for us, which is often quoted by Prabhupada, verse number 54. Brahma Bhutta Prasanatma, right? One who knows his Brahman, he is Prasanatma. He's a joyful soul. And why is he joyful? Because Nasochati Nakanchati is not hankering for anything and he's not lamenting about anything. Sama Sarveshu Bhuti Shu, he sees everyone equal. Madbhaktim Labhati Param. Now he can go on to become situated in devotional service. And that is, that will be his perfection when he comes to the devotional, when he takes up devotional service. So verse 54 is very important. Prabhupada explains, it. We'll, we'll read first translation. One who is thus transcendentally situated at once realizes the Supreme Brahman and becomes fully joyful. He never laments or desires to have anything. He is equally disposed towards every living entity. In that state he attains pure devotional service unto me. Okay? So, and then in Prabhupada's purport, th th this verse is very good preaching for the impersonalists. Because I, as I said, the impersonalists, they're thinking that to come to the Brahman, that's the goal. And for them, it's a lot of work, it's a long labor to come to Brahman. But for a devotee, very quickly we can come to the Brahman. A any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, how many uh, paths are there for perfection? Is it three or four? Like three means karma yoga, jnana yoga, and uh, devotion service, or four, uh, including uh, meditation, jnana yoga? In the Bhagavad Gita, the, the four main yogas are identified. Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Dhyana Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga. So Maharaj, this... I was reading uh, Uddhava Gita. Yes. There, Lord Krishna says to Uddhava, uh, there is a three paths only uh, 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 like that he says. There are what? Three... Lord Krishna says to Uddhava, only three paths. Uh, karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and uh, uh, Dhyosa service. Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and, dev and Bhakti, huh? Eh? He didn't recognize... Karma, Jnana, Bhakti. Karma, Jnana, and Bhakti. Oh, yeah, okay. Jnana. Well, that just means that they've incorporated the Jnana in the other Yoga. The, the, the Jnana Yoga, Astanga Yoga, or they didn't take it as being very important. So, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has put it, and Krishna has included it. But in the Uddhava Gita, I may not have mentioned it, not very important. Dhyana meditation, that it can be considered part of the Jnana Yoga. The Jnana Yogis, they often do meditation. They go on to meditate, right? We showed the picture, the Jnana Yogi meditating. So, they've just combined the two into one. But it's, it's there, within it. The elements are within it. Just like in Bhakti Yoga, within Bhakti Yoga, all the other elements of the other yogas are also there. So three main paths. Any other questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. This text number 54, the translation, one who is thus transcendentally situated at once, realizes the Supreme Brahman. This Brahman word we have to understand Maharaj as Brahman or as uh, uh, Kruparswar Maharaj, uh, as, uh, as the Supreme Lord. One who is thus trans transcendentally situated realizes the Brahman, right? Yes, yes. 
Maharaj. In the purport, is it? In the translation, Maharaj. Uh huh. Well, Prabhupada has put the Supreme Brahman, one who is thus transcendentally situated, and once realizes the Supreme Brahman. Yes, he, he realizes the Supreme Brahman uh, because the Supreme Brahman is not different from Paramatma and Bhagavan. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it said, Learned transcendentalists know the Absolute Truth, call this non dual substance as Brahman. Paramatma and Bhagavan. So some people know the Supreme Lord as Brahman, some know him as Paramatma and some know him as Bhagavan. But it's the same thing, no difference. So the Supreme Brahman, is, they may not recognize the Bhagavan feature, but they know him also, they know that Brahman is the Supreme Brahman. So different features of Krishna are there. They, one may not recognize that this Brahman is actually the Supreme, but it is. It's just one feature. Just like one who sees the sunlight, we say, oh, the sun, come in the sun. You know, we're in the sunlight. The sunlight is not different from the sun, the sun planet. The sunlight is the energy of the sun, not different from the sun. So the same way the Brahman is not different from the Supreme Lord, from the Supreme Brahman. Understand? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Different. Yes? Kingdom of God means spiritual world, the spiritual world, Vaikuntha, Goloka, not heavenly planet. Heavenly planet sits in the material world. That's heavenly planet is Swarga, you know, that's the de where the demigods live. You go there by Punya Karma, you can go to the heavenly planets by Punya Karma, but to go to the kingdom of God, you have to have pure love for Krishna. You have to have bhakti to go to the kingdom of God. Maharaj, here one more clarification. We are living in this part of our earth, you know, in the corporate world we work. And we do have, you know, we do the bhakti, but same time we have expectation also. Like we go to the work and a lot of expectation from our colleagues uh, and And so that means it is not a pure consciousness, right? right? So that does not what? We, do we are in a pure consciousness because we, we, when we go out, we are in a different uh, world, like in a corporate world. Yes. Are we in a uh, proper state of mind, like you know, when we come uh, back to home, when we are in a, you know, bhakti, or we are in office also, we are in bhakti, but we, there is an expectation in everywhere. Yes. So well. In that case, in that case, we are in a pure uh, transcendental uh, Well, it depends on you. If you do a good sadhana, just like before you go to work, you have to do a sadhana, you have to chant the, the holy name, you have to do japa, you have to hear, do some worship of the Lord. You have to cultivate your bhakti so that you can go into the corporate world and not be affected. Right? We have to prepare ourselves. Just like a doctor, he goes in to fight an epidemic, he has to make sure he doesn't get the infection. He doesn't, just like this COVID-19, there's so many medical workers, they have to be very careful they don't get infected. 
So they take great care that they don't get infected. So the same way you're going in the corporate world, you have to take care to protect yourself. Or a fireman is going to fight fire, he takes care to protect himself. So you have to protect yourself. You ha and the protection comes by having a good sadhana before you go to the job, that you do first of all chanting, and that you only eat prasada, and you, you take time to do some spiritual practice, and that will give you the, pot the potency and the power to be affected by the material atmosphere. You understand? Yes. This, this is a very important point. You know, anybody can be devotee, but you know, we, we have to keep our Krishna consciousness. You, you have to go to work, of course, you have to work, but you have to keep up your spiritual practice also. And that will protect us. And that will give us a, the potency to do the work better. Don't think it's a waste of time. It's very important. And you get great power from it. So, just like Arjuna, he has to fight. Krishna is telling him, you have to do your duty, you have to fight. But Krishna also tells Arjuna, remember me. So that's important. We have, you have to be able to remember Krishna when you're there in the job. So, Remember Krishna and also fight, do the duty. So it may, you may think very difficult. No, just you practice. By practice you can do it. So uh, let's look at this. Uh, I just wanted to go actually to 54 today. I didn't want to go any further than 54. Now, we just look a little bit longer at the purport here. Prabhupada explains here, to the impersonalist, achieving the Brahma Buddha stage, becoming one with the Absolute is the last word. But for the personalist or pure devotee, one has to go still further to become engaged in pure devotional service. This means that one who is engaged in pure devotional service to the Supreme Lord is already in a liberation called Brahma Bhutta, oneness with the Absolute. Without being one with the Supreme, the Absolute, one cannot render service unto Him. In the absolute conception, there is no difference between the served and the servitor, yet the distinction is there in a higher spiritual sense. Okay, so yeah, the Lord is the master and we are his servants. But we have come to the platform of Brahman. But on the platform of Brahman, we are a tiny spark of the Brahman. He is the Parabrahman. He is the Supreme Brahman. Right? In the 10th chapter, Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna declared to Krishna, Param Brahm, Param Dham, Pavitram Paramam Bhava. He's telling Ar Krishna, Arjuna is saying to Krishna, You are the Supreme Brahman. We are not the Supreme Brahman. We are Brahman, but we are tiny sparks of the Brahman. Different in qual quantity. Same quality, different quantity. So, this we've heard how the Jnana Yogi comes to the platform of Brahma Bhutta, he becomes joyful, he's detached from the body. It's not Krishna consciousness yet. He's just detached from the body. He's not hankering or lamenting, no material desires. He's, so, it's a very nice level, it's an advanced stage to come to that platform, but it's not perfection and one can fall down from that platform, come to that stage with a lot of endeavour, but because there's no real 
connection to Krishna, you're not really secure because there's no activity. They don't know what activity to do, perform on the spiritual platform. That's the real problem. There's no engagement. So the jnana yogi will not be satisfied just to come to the Brahman, do nothing, stop everything, not this, not this, nothing, all negation, no activity. But devotees are very active. Our business is hearing and chanting, just like we're hearing from Bhagavad Gita, Krishna's own words, and we want to chant also and repeat. In the material concept of life, second paragraph of the purport, when one works for sense gratification, there is misery. But in the absolute world, when one is engaged in pure devotional service, there is no misery. Devotee in Krishna consciousness has nothing for which to lament or desire. Since God is full, a living entity, who is engaged in God's service in Krishna consciousness becomes also full in himself, just like a river cleansed of all dirty water. A pure devotee has no thoughts other than Krishna. He is naturally always joyful. He does not lament for any material loss or aspire for gain because he is full in the service of the Lord. He has no desire for material enjoyment because he knows every living entity is a fragmental part and parcel of the Lord and therefore eternally a servant. He does not see in the material world something as higher or someone as lower. Higher and lower positions are ephemeral. ephemeral. And a devotee has nothing to do with such spiritual, with such ephemeral appearances or disappearances. Okay, so Prabhupada is just describing this detachment from the body, Brahma Buddha stage. There's some pleasure there, some happiness there. But that happiness of Brahman, that is only one tiny drop of the happiness which is there compared to pure devotional service, Krishna consciousness. A big difference between the two. So, important point is, on the spiritual platform one is joyful. Prabhupada always liked to see devotees happy. If he saw some devotee not looking happy, looking very troubled and what, he would tell him, you are not in Krishna consciousness because devotee means joyful soul. Devotional service is performed on the platform of Brahman. We should be prasan atma, we should be joyful. Chanting, dancing, taking prasadam, hearing about Krishna, working for Krishna. Sometimes you make money, sometimes you lose money. It's all Krishna's mercy. Sometimes Krishna gives, sometimes Krishna takes. We just try to do our duty without attachment. Difficult. But this, this is devotional service. Sometimes Krishna can give, Sometimes Krishna can take. Right now Krishna is taking a lot from the world. Everybody's put into great difficulty, everybody's struggling. Hmm? All the businesses are no money, all the airlines are broke, everything gone in great difficulty. What to do? Simply have to depend on Krishna. Devotee accepts everything, the good and the bad, Krishna's mercy. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, the difficulties which we go through in devotional service 
are our greatest happiness. The easygoing life of sense gratification is not good for us. Simply make us attached to the material world. Simply become comfortable in our material situation, which is very temporary. At any moment we have to leave it. We don't know. So we have to cultivate this detachment. Very important. At the same time, do your duty. Stand and fight. Hmm? Okay? Any questions? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu? If, we, if I see that somebody has intentionally is doing something against me, so still I should think that as a Krishna's, uh, Krishna is doing for me? Yes, well, somebody is doing something against you, you have to, you, maybe you have to take steps to make sure that, you know, he doesn't do you any harm. You have to protect yourself. Not that, not that we should just let ever, anybody do whatever they want to you and you're supposed to tolerate. No, of course. Somebody is doing something, unfit, dealing with you in an improper manner or unfair manner, you have to take steps to protect yourself because you're acting on behalf of Krishna. You're Krishna's devotee. So you have to do whatever is necessary to, 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 to maintain yourself, to keep up your position. To maintain your health, to maintain your life, you have to you have to do whatever is required. At the same time, so Maharaj, then this COVID might have been done by some. At the same time, we shouldn't think that whoever is doing something to you is your enemy. A devotee doesn't have an enemy. We see everybody equally. But somebody's not doing very nice to you, so okay, you take care to protect yourself so that you don't get harmed. Yeah, right? You have to take care, we don't get the infection, right? We don't want to get this COVID up. We've got to protect ourselves, we don't want to get that. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, I have a question. Uh, some devotees might think that uh, they want to become a dust at the lotus feet of Krishna. So if they become a dust, then how they will serve? <laughs> well, the dust can be very soft for Krishna to walk on. Rather than have Krishna walk on the stones, Rather than have Krishna walk on the thorns, if they become the dust, then it will make a nice floor for Krishna to walk on. So that's service for Krishna. Yeah. But, of course, better, well, it's not a very active service. General. Dust is, dust is really matter, it's not actually, con there's no consciousness really there in the dust. There's different rasas for the service to Krishna and santaras is the neutrality, relationship and neutrality. Santaras is there in the cows and the flowers, these kind of things. They have consciousness. But they're simply there for Krishna's pleasure. The cows and the flowers, Krishna can enjoy the aroma of the flowers, Krishna enjoys the cows. So they, they do some service for Krishna, but they don't have the real active mood of service, like a servant or like a parent or a friend, you know, different levels of service. So Shantarasa, is there, 
not, not so much dust. Uddhava, Ud, Uddhava prayed he wanted to become a creeper in Vrindavan. And they said the reason why he wanted to become a creeper was so he could get the dust, he could get contact with the lotus feet of the devotees like the gopis. So he thought if he could become a creeper in Vrindavan or some kind of plant in Vrindavan, when they walk around then they will touch him with their feet. And he thought that would be very purifying, very powerful for him. This is a, a very high level of Krishna consciousness. Okay, any more questions tonight? So tomorrow night we have to go on and finish the Bhagavad Gita, complete our study of the Bhagavad Gita. So please look over everything if you have any more questions, any points you're not sure. Tomorrow night and uh, next on uh, Sunday night, we will meet. Yes. Uh, what is the word limit for the orientation? Sorry, not hearing. Uh, Sorry, voice is breaking. Can you say again? Maharaj, she's asking the word uh, limit for the OBA question. Oh. Uh, Jai Govinda Prabhu, are you there? Yeah, I think it's 300, Maharaj. We, we did before also. It's 300 words. Oh, 300 words only. Oh. Uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, it is 500 to 600, Maharaj. Oh, 5 to 600. Yeah, I thought 300 is a bit small. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 5 to 600. Uh, Sorry? Uh, Maraj, uh, you know, today, coming back to today's verse, uh, Swadabhya Nidane Shreya, it's better to perform one uh, own occupational duty uh, than uh, taking someone else. Okay, in this connection, Maharaj, in Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, Naratmani explained to Vasudev, Tektva Swadharmam Charanam Bhujam Harir. So maybe, you know, like when when a devotee takes up devotional service, may fall while he is at immature state. But there is no loss of he being unsuccessful. Yes. On the contrary, a non-devotee uh, doing his padarma, okay, and he does not need anything. So how, how do we connect that verse with uh, this Bhagavad Gita verse, Maharaj? Uh. Well, let's see. Takvasva dharmam charanam bhajamhar. Vyasadev, Narada Muni is telling Vyasadev. Yes. Giving up, one who gives up the duty, that it's, there's no loss. A little advancement made to, to his great benefit, even if he may fall down, it may be unsuccessful. So, That, you see, uh, that's talking about spiritual duty, because takvaswa uh, dharmam, that's giving up material duties to take up our spiritual duty. But in the Bhagavad Gita here, they're talking about doing, changing from one material duty to another material duty, both on the material platform. Simply changing from one material one the, the Vaishya is thinking, oh, it's too much trouble to be a Vaishya, I have to lie, let me be a Brahmana. Like that. So this, this is this material platform. But Vyasadeva, that verse, Takvaswa Dharma, is talking about giving up the material duty to take up the spiritual duty, to take up the devotional activities. Okay, okay Maharaj. Okay, thank you, thank you, Maharaj. Uh-huh. Uh, 
Maharaj, if you don't mind, uh, can you briefly explain about uh, Narsim Mathadadashi, which happened yesterday? Can you briefly explain, Maharaj? Though many of us, uh, you know, watched in Mayapur TV, but we would like to hear from your uh, Lotus Mouth, Maharaj. Uh, particularly, you want to hear about what, the activities we were doing here? Or, or the, the festival, the, the significance of the festival? No, just, uh, yeah, what all, I mean, uh, the, the key point of yesterday's program, the celebration of Nashinga Chaturdeshi. Yes, well, uh, every year we celebrate the appearance of Lord Nashinga Dev. It's a very important festival on the Vaishnava calendar. And uh, Lord Nashinga Dev appears at dusk. Because that's, you know, Lord Brahma had given benediction to Haranyakashipu that he could not die in the day or in the night. So Lord Nasringadev, when he's fighting with Haranyakashipu, he has to wait for the junction between day and night before he can kill Haranyakashipu. Because Haranyakashipu had that benediction from Brahma. And Lord Nasringadev wants to. You know, he, Brahma gives a benediction, Lord Nasringadev has to recognize that. And so that's the significance of the festival fasting until the evening. Because it's at, it's at that particular time when Lord Nasringadev appeared. And he appears in answer to the prayers of... Uh, to, and uh, he appears because he's, he's so angry at the treatment which his devotee Prahlad has been getting that Haranyakashipu has been very offensive to Prahlad, his own son. So Lord Nasringadev appeared to, uh, to fight with Haranyakashipu and to punish him for all his bad treatment of the devotee Prahlad. So he, Lord Nasringadev appears at the dusk. And uh, traditionally, on the appearance of Vishnu avatars, it's customary, we do Abhishek, we perform the bathing of the deity. Actually, in Mayapur, the day before Nishinga Chaturdasi, we first of all uh, bathe the deity in oil. Because for many days, the Lord Nishinga Dev deity had been covered in Chandan. The Chandan Yatra began, you know, and we covered Madhava. It's a Krishna festival, so Lord Madhava was given sandalwood paste, chandan. And we put the chandan also on Lord Nishingadev and also on Prahlad, because they were very hot. So for many days they had the chandan on them. So we, took, we removed the chandan and then bathed the deities, uh, Lord Nishingadev and Prahlad Maharaj, bathed them in oil different oils, sandalwood oil and other aguru oil and different oils, mixture of oils. And that was the day before Nishringa Chaturdasi. And then yesterday we gave the traditional Abhishek with Panchagavya, meaning ghee and honey and yogurt and milk and water and other juices and coconut water as well. So that's the Abhishek was performed, signifying the appearance of the Lord. So Nishinga Chaturdasi, the 14th day of the moon, the Chaturdasi, Lord Nishinga Dev appears for the pleasure of his devotee Prahlad. So Lord Nishinga Dev is very powerful incarnation. Prabhupada instructed us. When his health was not good, the devotees asked Prabhupada, what could we do for him? And Prabhupada said, at that time, he said, you can put this picture of Lord Nasringadeva on the altar. And then he said, after the arti, then you can sing this uh, Nasringa Stotra, which was taken from the uh, ja uh, Gita Govinda by Jayadev Goswami. So the beginning of Gita Govinda, there's Dasavata Stotra. Lord Jayadev Goswami has made this uh, Dasavata Stotra, glorifying all the ten avatars. And Lord Nasringadev is the fourth avatar. First there's Matsya, then Kurma, then Varaha, and then Nasringa. 
So Lord Narsinga, half man, half lion. Why does the Lord come half man, half lion? Again, to keep the benedictions which Brahma had given to Aranyakashipu, because Aranyakashipu had said that well, he wanted the benediction that he should not be killed by any man or any beast or any god. So the Lord comes in a half man, half lion form. This way to keep all the benedictions. Another benediction, he should not be killed in the day or in the night. So he's killed at the junction of the two. He should not be killed on the land or in the water or in the air. So he was killed on the lap of the Lord. When Lord Nishrinidev fought with Harani Kashipu, he took him and he picked him up and put him on his lap and ripped open his intestines. So he did all, Lord Nishrinidev did all this in front of Prahlad Maharaj. And Prahlad Maharaj was then given the responsibility after the death of his father, Prahlad Maharaj had to come and offer prayers to Lord Nishrinidev. And all the different demigods, they had already come and they were, they were not successful. Lord Nishringadev was so angry, they could not calm him down. Even they brought Lakshmi, who is the consort of Lord Nishringadev, because Lord Nishringadev is not different from Lord Vishnu. So Lakshmi is his consort. Lord and we say Lakshmi Nishringa. The Lord is worshipped with Lakshmi. And... Uh, the, Lakshmi was not able to pacify him. So then they thought how to pacify Lord Narsingha Devi, so angry. So then they brought Prahlad and when Prahlad came forward, then Lord Narsingha Devi just put his hand on his head. And his, the lotus hand of Lord Narsingha Devi on the head of Prahlad Maharaj uh, allowed Prahlad Maharaj to offer wonderful prayers to Lord Narsingha Devi. So Prahlad Maharaj is a very special devotee. He is a Nitya Siddha. He comes from the spiritual world to show us what is pure devotional service. And he shows us how tolerant devotee has to be in preaching Krishna consciousness. Prahlad Maharaj was just trying to teach Krishna consciousness, but his father did not like it. His father took objection. Prahlad was in the Gurukula for, and this guru, was a special Gurukula, it was for all the demons and they were trained how to be demons and demons are concerned with uh, defeating their enemies and taking advantage of other people, they're, de they're concerned with uh, uh, asserting their authority over others. So. Prahlad Maharaj was supposed to be trained in this, but Prahlad Maharaj, because as, when he was in the womb of his mother, his mother was in the ashram of Narada Muni. And at that time, when he was in the ashram of Narada Muni, he had the opportunity to hear spiritual knowledge. And from Narada Muni, Narada Muni had taught him that nobody is your enemy. You see everybody equal. So Prahlad would always try to tell his father like that. But you know, if you've ever tried preaching to your father, you can know it's very difficult. So Prahlad Maharaj had a difficult time trying to preach to his father. His father hated Vishnu. And Prahlad Maharaj would tell his father that you should worship Vishnu, you should be... His father would get out, become so livid with anger, so he'd become so upset. So when he heard that Prahlad was preaching to the other boys and trying to make the other boys also devotees, then Harani Kashipu decided he wanted to kill Prahlad. And so it was at that time that Lord Nishingadeva appeared. So Lord Nishingadeva appeared, fought with Harani Kashipu and killed him. And then Prahlad offered his prayers and then Lord Nishingadev told Prahlad, you should ask for some benediction. But Prahlad said, no, I don't want anything. I don't need anything. I'm not a businessman. I didn't worship you to get something. But Lord Nishingadev said, no, you should. 
So Prahlada said, bless me that in my heart there will be no material desires. So then Haram, Prahlada also said, I'm just worried about my father because my father was such a demon. But he said, I know he's been fortunate because he contacted Lord Nishingadev and he was on the lap of Lord Nishingadev. So he must have been purified. So I'm just, but I'm just worried that he did so many bad things, maybe he would go to hell. But Lord Nishingadev said, no. He said, because Prahlad, you are a good devotee, so not only is your father delivered, but everyone in your family for 21 generations, they're all delivered just by the presence of a devotee like Prahlad. So that's a very instructive point. If we become a good devotee, we can give benefit to our family. And then Lord Nasringadev ordered Prahlad Maharaj to become the king and to rule in the place of his father. And he told Prahlad Maharaj he would stay in this world for the period of one man Vantara, the life of one Manu. In one day of Brahma there are 14 Manus, so one Manu lives for 72 Divya Yugas. Divya Yuga means the four cycles, Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dwapara Yuga, Kali Yuga, 1000 times. So he would live for 72 of those Divya Yugas. A long time. And, and then at the end of that, then Prahlad would go back, back to Godhead, to Vaikuntha. So that's uh, the story about uh, worshipping Lord Nasringadev. Very important festival. And all the devotees, we all took part, worshipped Lord Nasringadev and spoke the glories of Lord Nasringadev and Prahlad Maharaj. And we're always praying to Lord Nishingadev and Prahlad to protect us and to protect the spiritual teachers and to protect the devotees. And by the it said even Ganesh, usually, you know, in Hindu culture people worship Ganesh to destroy obstacles. But Ganesh himself is a devotee of Nishingadev. And he gets his power and his strength from Lord Nishingadev. So within Krishna Consciousness, we directly worship Lord Nishringadev, who is the Lord Himself. Okay? Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so we'll finish off here now and we'll look forward. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada Ki. Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Dandabhats Pranams. Hare Krishna.